Thanks for tuning into our podcast. I refuse to say the name out loud. This is Dion. And this is Anniki. Our podcast is two degenerate furries who happen to live together, turning their normal rants and trailing off into a premiere listening experience about design. Content! For the masses. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare for some spicy hot takes and some absolutely Antarctic ones. We hope you enjoy our general sense of laxness and crust. We're doing this all pretty much spur of the moment and there's gonna be some mess. Some mess. A lot of mess. <laughs> Okay, it's the podcast. It is. So you just finished reading B Stars. Thoughts? <sighs> we probably should preface this. This is the very first thing we're talking about. Spoilers for B Star. <laughs> oh yeah. Spoilers <laughs> for let's say any furry related media. We have a sticky note. Yeah. B Stars, B and A or Brand New Animal. Yes, brand new animal. There she <clears throat> is. We're gonna talk about that oldness. We're going to talk about Zootopia. We're going to talk about Undertale. That's that's on the docket. We're talking about furry media today. Yeah, so potential spoilers for any of that. Well, yeah. de definite spoilers for some of it. Yeah, <laughs> definite spoilers for Beastars. Go on, continue. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I told you how I was prepping for disappointment because at the point where I was at like five chapters back, it, I didn't see an ending that was going to make me happy, like within five chapters. But... I mean, it, this one didn't make me happy, but it all that disappointment prepped me for not as much disappointment as I got from this really bare bones ending. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of like when you watch like a generic action movie and then the guy gets the girl at the end. <laughs> and it, it's It's almost cute and interesting in its own way that we haven't gotten that in a while. So it's like... Well, I, I was expecting some sort of wild, subversive sort of ending, something crazy, because that's just the media we've been <laughs> getting for a while. Yeah, that's true. I do like how the characters were portrayed in the ending, as far as like how they all get a logical conclusion when things are quote unquote back to normal and stable or whatever. And I think Haru's bit of dialogue in the end, where she's talking about like she doesn't want to be behind. Lugosi all the time. Like, that's something that made a lot of personal stuff click yeah, for me. Yeah, I kind of caught that, too. Uh, we, we, we've we had this long joke about Lugosi being your persona base, essentially, and then how relevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but not to dive too deep into your personal stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I guess where I'll leave the personal stuff off is, like, Haru very much reminds me of a significant other that I had for 10 years. And it's very hard to like her character because of that, because I it clicks too much. Yeah. I don't know. It was thankfully inoffensive as the ending, but like at least a crazy ass ending would have been more interesting, I suppose. Well, yeah, because the whole last arc we got was really just <laughs> Joker is the <laughs> bad guy. Let's put a smile on that face. <laughs> <It's>... <sighs> <laughs> Where are the bunny girls? <laughs> Where is she? <laughs> oh my god, it, it is. And, and it came so out of nowhere. I think that's why I was expecting a crazy ass ending because this whole arc was crazy ass out of nowhere. I mean, it still fits within the line of a murder mystery in a way that there's a murderer and he's mysterious. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It's stretching, you know, the connection to the original first arc of Beastars. Yeah, I, I, oh man, I don't like that. I don't like that it's it's so outside the realm of uh, kind of what Beastars was up until halfway through Melon's arc, where he's just kind of like he's the new problem in yeah. Lugosi's life, right? 
But now it's like about society or whatever, and Lugosi gets to be a chosen one or whatever. Yeah, it's just (laughs) it's really about sending a message. (laughs) It's really frustrating, and I I know I've been more eloquent about this in the past to someone else, but now that I'm in front of a microphone on a podcast, I'm gonna have a hard time remembering what the hell it was I was trying to say. But the idea of how B Stars beforehand was kind of like small scale, its own thing. It didn't have that big, grand, here's society and all the main characters are directly influencing it. It was, here's how all of the characters are influenced by the world that they live in. And we've had a lot of stories in furry media lately. Keep doing the, you know, racism allegory. Oh, God. I've been thinking about that a little bit lately with Zootopia. And I think I was telling you about, like, I I can allow myself to simp for Judy a little bit because Bunny Girls is pretty well up my alley. But the Zootopia universe, while desperately trying to make the racism bad Disney thing that Disney half-heartedly puts in things it does so in a universe where cops are significantly better people than they are in ours so the idea of somebody being like i want to be a cop to protect people is like okay that's at least a li- it, it, it's separated enough from our world for me to not go judy cop my socialist leftist self is like uh-uh nah <laughs> yeah judy is a cop with connections to the mob <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah, she like directly has connections to the mob. She uh, like I don't know how you would put it at this point, but like she kind of like unearthed like this whole conspiracy theory, but then she like is immediately part of whatever the next one is going to be. Like you know she is. There's no escape from that at this point. I think what saves me about Judy as a character is if she were in like a grim dark universe where, you know, police are more like ours, if not just like ours. But at that kind of situation, I could convince her to be some sort of like anarchist terrorist and I it wouldn't be too hard to convince her. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I could change I, her. I, I think the idea is that she comes into the beginning of the movie like, oh, I want to move to the city and do good things. Therefore, I want to be a cop. Yeah. Right. But the message by the end of the movie isn't it. it well, well, it is. The government is corrupt and you can't trust it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's for like different reasons. It's and diet. Then she she comes out. <laughs> she comes out at the end like still a cop and you're like wasn't that like the message that you like learned was that you did not need to be a cop to do the right thing and that that was kind of like part of the problem was the rigmarole of being a a police officer one other issue i have with judy's character is in the way that they are trying so desperately to make this racism in the real world comparison in this cutesy animal world that is 100% not ready to make the leap to make it as realistic as they're trying to. They made Judy kind of racist in the beginning. Yeah. There's just really something that rose me the wrong way about, oh, she learned her lesson. It was real insignificant to the plot. <laughs> yeah. But getting back to how this wraps around to Beastars is like, Beastars kind of has the same placate bullshit message because a lot of furry media does at this point. You stopped the one bad guy, and then suddenly... Racism's over! <laughs> yeah, suddenly it's just uh, nobody nobody wants to hurt anybody anymore, and racism's over, and there is no prejudice. The amount of, like, political swing that people did over the course of, like, a single action in Beastars is very, like, it's, it's very Japanese anime manga type yeah. thing. <laughs> if you ever acknowledge it, then everything changes. Which is is not how the real world is. Unfortunately, I wish we could just have a shonen ass climax of I don't know. No, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Might have to bleep that one out. Uh, uh, on my podcast is fun. I might bleep that one out too. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we were talking about how one action does not inherently change all of society. Yeah, yeah. Opinion. As much as I would love a big shonen ending to racism 2020, I, I don't think 
that's possible because in the animes, it sure convinces everyone across the globe that whole like Digimon ending where everyone's contributing as a human race. But except all the racists would see that and go, oh, that's propaganda. Yeah. Or some some bullshit. No, some you're not going to convince racists that racism is bad through heartfelt experience. They're going to have to be afraid of it. <laughs> also, Beastars never, like, acknowledged the problem of, like, okay, the back alley market doesn't exist anymore. The place where 100% of carnivores were getting their meat. Are they just going to fucking attack people now? Because you established that they have to have meat or they go a little psycho. Like, you established that as part of your story. And then you said... The back alley market's gone now because we can't fight amongst ourselves. And it's like, okay, so you ended the manga at the point of the biggest conflict. You didn't end the manga at the... You just... You, you made everything worse. I think honestly. it tries to end on a hopeful note. They're in positions now to do something about it. But that just feels like there should be a continuation. Because it feels like, at least to me, the blatant path to where this was going was Legos is going to be a beast star. Yeah. Because, I mean, it looked like the horse guy was going to die for a sec. At least that could have been foreshadowing to it if the series was continuing. And then now Lewis is like the head CEO of this place and he's got a big fucking heart on for a wolf chick. But also not. But also, I mean, he's still got the power to do things that he believes in and he believes in good things. <laughs> yeah, this would have been a really good, like, or a really good arc to be like, okay, now that these characters are in positions of power, their personal affairs are all tied up, now they can do something about society and then you have a last arc and then you wrap everything up. Yeah. But it was really weird to be like, this arc was the one that wrapped everything up. Especially when you dropped us so many, like, new characters and new concepts. <sighs> Some of them got got way too much screen time for what what they were worth like the the new rabbit character got way more screen time than it was worth the whole stand thing never came up again like there's <laughs> right <laughs> there's all sorts of stuff like that that they do in the last arc that it's like uh, i don't have uh, too like... big of an issue with drop plots or like plot holes because i mean i fucking love jojo and it's just riddled with that kind of bullshit. Yeah, but I mean, there's something about both the aesthetic and the storytelling direction yeah. that JoJo has where it's fine. And I think that's where it's not okay with me as much with Beastars is because it all felt like it was accumulated to something as opposed to just like little notes that were left behind, except for like maybe the stand rabbit animal thing that didn't yeah. seem like it was gonna go super far but i don't know it, it just it felt like the melon arc was not the end of v stars no, not at all <laughs> yeah i i didn't think at the beginning of it that it would even remotely translate to the ending with bringing in like lugosi's grandfather as technically a completely unnecessary character I like him, but I also... like him, but he's an unnecessary. Yeah, character. <laughs> I like I like his character, but you didn't use him. Yeah. Horseman is still evil, by the way. He yeah. still just kills people and uses them as fertilizer. They never resolved that. He never got prosecuted. He never suffered any consequences. Was he doing it to only people that were like bad? They kind of said loosely, maybe they didn't give us like a definitive on that. And that's something I used to like about the feel of Beastars too, that was just really absent by the end is like an ambiguity it became more of a shown in black and white thing when even like the good people are still kind of doing shitty things because this society has no it only has like fake lines defined of where good and bad is it has no like moral structure of predators that are this that and this it's really gray you know yeah and it wasn't gray by the end <laughs> we'll all eat fish and be happy yeah, was that the was that supposed to be like the the resolution thing? Was they eat fish now? <laughs> I really I really hope not. I just remembered that detail as I said it. God, what a fucking cop out that would be. That's it's such a huge but cop it's out. It's kind of that like what's implied. It, that doesn't solve any of society's problems. That didn't that doesn't inherently change anything. And that's honestly kind of worse because what that means is, you know, the SEAL dude is explaining how sea society works. It's they just accept that they can be eaten at any point 
and can't eat at any point. And so the land animals that are having this moral issue about it are just like, well, we'll just eat the fish. They don't care. <laughs> yeah. And then that very quickly becomes, oh, we'll eat the herbivores too because you just have to accept that you're alive and you might be eaten. Like that. that's where that logic goes. Yeah. That's where it goes in real life is, oh, we have an excuse. So now we're just going to slippery slope this until we can abuse everybody. And like a, we are all one kind of spiritual way. The way the sea works in that way is interesting and unique. I wouldn't say if you're trying to build a society that has equal value for every life, that's the way you should go. <laughs> and that's the way animal society is seeming to try to go. Yeah. So it, it's real fuck. It just got so spotty by the end. The whole series. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hard to nail down every like missed opportunity, but I feel like there were there were so many of them. A lot of the character stuff that they started doing with everybody who wasn't Lugosi and Melon was just like unnecessary. By that by that point, the stuff that was going on with like Lewis and Juno didn't matter. It was it was not really important, especially with it ending how it did, because she just walks away and stops caring. There's the whole idea of Haru just like I understand like suicidal ideation and all of that sort of bullshit. But Haru just straight up like while she's in a relationship with Lugosi understands like all of this different shit about like why she is suffering with that and why their relationship might not work and whether she can just be eaten by him or not. At no point in the earlier part of her life, especially when she was at school, did she ever feel like or did she ever seem like the type of character who was just going to be like, I give up. So for her to like get to that point and then just be like oh yeah you could eat me i don't fucking care that's just what why that is one thing i do like about the author's writing of characters is they feel realistic in the way that they don't always make sense but it feels like there's reasoning from behind what they do it, it feels like there's a brain th process that a bubble didn't give us that made them come to some conclusion and it's kind of a show or a, a not show or tell but you get it in a way <laughs> if you know what yeah, I, mean? <laughs> I, I mean i understand I understand why her character would do that. I don't think but it's I also, good. But... I I don't think it's good, and I don't I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I think it also contradicts a lot of what was strong about her character to begin with was that she was kind of just a I'm going to do what makes me feel happy and feel free all the time. And you could say like, yeah, her saying just fuck it, I'll get eaten is that. But mm, she was giving up. Yeah. Like, that was her mental process at that point. How I really stand all of it. Because I don't want to shit talk every furry thing. We, I mean, we got Undertale on this list, so we're not going to shit talk everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, moving on to something that does it right with the racism. Well, just the uh, oppression equivalency thing to the real world is that there she is, those flash animations. Yeah. I remember seeing, like the i didn't i couldn't understand it because it's in korean but even just back in high school the animation the part of it where like the words are painted on the vending machines uh it's obviously she's it, like some sort of slur or something she's being oppressed and it's like that's real shit zootopia didn't touch real shit like that <laughs> yeah when you have you have like parts of those characters families who are like okay with the relation most of the most of the family is okay with it. And then there's like that one relative who's like really bent up about it for no fucking reason. Yeah. And everybody still tolerates them for whatever reason. But there's also like the big societal like combatant thing. And that's that's how that shit really feels. I remember uh, I saw those animations in high school back when I had just come out. And that's that's the prime shit when you feel like the world against you is right when you come out. And those animations hit so hard because of it. Because just that whole pressure of from from all sides. But then it also did the climax, the shonen thing, way better because it didn't changed the world but it changed those people's lives yeah these two people getting together and then everyone around them realizing oh hey maybe we shouldn't be racist <laughs> yeah it's not gonna ch it wasn't gonna change everybody's minds but it changed the people who it needed to it changed enough that they could be together it resolved enough of their problems in a realistic way it's never going to be perfect but it's better 
Yeah. That's real life. That's what you do all the time. You you cope. I, I will always simp for those animations and say that they just did Zootopia and Beastars better than Zootopia and Beastars did. <laughs> yeah. I still can't tell if Beastars is just derivative of Zootopia in that tie it up in a bow, it's fine now. I have I have some friends who live in Japan. I have friends who study a lot of Japanese. I study a lot of Japanese culture. There's a certain amount of disconnect with the whole racial oppression thing because they don't really they don't Understand. really ha- they don't really have race in their yeah. culture that's not really a thing so like uh, japan's been an isolationist country for i don't know let me check my watch 5000 years <laughs> so the idea of different races meaning something politically is completely new as of them getting internet connection so they don't really understand the concept of one person being oppressed as in in the same sort of vein as like we would over here yeah but at least that made the horny good because to that artist it probably meant that they probably made the connection between the like predator and prey and the inherent like there's definitely horny tension there also. Yeah. I think Beast that Stars made it is, more obvious. <laughs> Beastars is very horny. It's extremely horny. I remember reading the manga and thinking like, you know, this is decently tame as yeah. far as like... I'm scared for season content. two. That had like two or three hornier scenes than season one. <laughs> the, the anime, yeah. And that one scene, <laughs> like... You can almost get off to that. <laughs> like, I'm sure some people could. <laughs> it looks like a porn animation. Yeah, it it looks like someone was sitting at their desk and they were like, I know. <laughs> I know what the people want. It's so horny. <laughs> yeah, and, and when you're reading a manga, because I was reading the manga at the same time as we were watching the anime to see like how it holds up one-to-one. Yeah. When you read the manga and you're watching that scene, in the manga, he's just like kind of like holding over her. He's not really even directly touching her. And then like in, in the anime, he's like grabbing titty and there's like, there's depth she, to it. Her hands running up his abdomen is like, god damn like you see the fur move and it's one of those like the people who did the animation for that those are real chads those have those people have had (laughs) sex before as someone who does not say for work content you can look at content of people who've had sex before who study while they do it and you know when someone has just gotten a ton of fucking (laughs) pussy (laughs) oh my parents are gonna listen to this i Uh, forgot about that (laughs) (laughs) sorry mr and mrs (laughs) (laughs) you're gonna use their real names too Uh, i'm bleeping that too fuck fuck that no Uh, so uh let's switch gears from horny b stars animation let's talk about bna a little bit oh yeah How, how did i forget that that will I forgot that was part of the conversation about the racism of Colin, because it's so watered down in that. It's, it's not even trying. Yeah. <laughs> BNA's not even fucking trying. And I'm kind of thankful, honestly, because <laughs> I, I'm at least hoping that someone along the way was like, wow, we really can't do this right, so let's focus on the trigger thing and just make it cool. <laughs> Well, I feel like Trigger already kind of, they already tackled racism in animal people form in Gurren Lagann. They already already did it. It's fine. Move along. I think that's another thing with Trigger and Gainax and all of it is they tackle these subjects in the way that they acknowledge them, but they don't dive into it in an over-explainy way because I think they know the writers there are just aware that that's going to get in the fucking way of everything else they're trying to do. Yeah. And they're not going to be able to do it right. Trigger's kind of known for being, like, creative and spontaneous with how they <sighs> do specific animation and certain kinds of storytelling. And then now they're just kind of doing that formula over and over and over and over and over again. And they've done it, like, I don't know, five or six times now. Oh. I think I'm good. I'm so ready for more. (laughs) It's the exact kind of stupid bullshit that I'm just like, please, please directly inject it into my veins. I thrive off of this. (laughs) I'm just, I'm done because I watched Gurren Lagann. I watched Kill a Kill. I've watched Space Patrol Luluko. I've watched like, 
I've watched all their shit. Yeah. So by the time I got to BNA, you know you're a real one if you watch Space Patrol, Lulu. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I've but I've watched all their shit, and once you get to like episode nine or whatever, you're like, I know what the entire plot is, and they're still gonna try to throw curveballs at me, and they're just not even real curveballs. Fuck, I knew the whole plot of BNA by episode four. Yeah. It, like someone someone thought it was a spoiler that freaking Shiro was Silver Wolf. His name means white wolf in Japanese. Yeah, at the moment I saw that statue and then he like showed up and I was like, Oh, that's episode one. When he looks up at the statue or something, or episode two, one of them, it's just, there's like a direct cinematic comparison and I'm like, You ju- you just told me. <laughs> yeah. Not even trying. They probably intended for a lot of people to know because it a lot of people watching Trigger's stuff are people who are watching it because it's Trigger's stuff. So they are aware of Trigger's bullshit. Like those cinematic comparisons where it's like, oh, look, he's the, he's the silver wolf. <laughs> well, when they did it in like... When they did it in Little Witch Academy, for instance, they gave you, like, the little nods towards, like, oh, yeah, the teacher is so-and-so. And, yeah, it's kind of obvious, but it also... Little Witch Academy just, it's kind of more for kids. So you can put those heavy hints in there, and then it's like, I wonder what's going to happen. I mean, they've been doing this shit since Garen Logan. Episode one starts with, and my favorite thing about people who watch Garen Logan, and like, you know, it's one of the first crazy ass things they've watched, is they go, oh my god, they were throwing galaxies around, the robots were like sizes of galaxies, bigger than galaxies, bigger than the universe, and then it's like, episode one opens up with him on the ship doing that battle and he's like having a monologue <laughs> yeah it does and i forget about that every time that's something i do love about Gurren logan and i'm not gonna go too far off on a tangent about Gurren logan in our furry <laughs> episode although it counts yeah there's tons and tons of little connections constantly in the writing that you don't notice unless you go back and rewatch it can't kind of think about rewatching it again god damn it <laughs> it's like fully coolie in the way that i swear as someone who's seen it 10 times there's more substance there <laughs> you have to watch fully coolie twice to understand what the shit is going on it was six times for me <laughs> I remember the sixth time particularly. All right. Well, it was a little more for me too, but I didn't want to get into that because the first time I had ever watched it, I think I was like five. True. It's it's old. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think I was staying up late on a school night and Fully Cooley was on and I was like, well, I don't know what this is, but it's cartoons, so I'm going to watch it. What the fuck were we talking about? BNA. <laughs> BNA. I'm going to complain about BNA some more. Say something nice about it immediately after so that I <laughs> we don't look like pricks. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the main character, her name is Michiru, right? Yeah. Her friend, what is her name? Oh, I can't remember. I, I'm so fucking bad with names. It's been like two months. I'm, I'm bad with anime character names because I always forget people's names when they're in subtitles. I don't know why. But her, the, the pink fox chick. Yeah. Worst friend ever. Like the worst person. Yeah. Like immediately she's shitty and like gaslighting and all sorts of this shit. She never gets any sort of redemption arc for it. She never apologizes. Bichiro just sort of suddenly says something jokey and then they're friends again. Yay, it's Matt and yay. That's not a character arc. That's not... Feel, Everything's better now. <laughs> I feel like it is potentially realistic that someone would, if you're good enough friends and your friend has a real shithole era of their life, but in this big climactic thing gets it, I think there could be a silent connection, but they don't even hint at that really. It, it, yeah. I think in the way that they do hint at that, it's just that things are better. And maybe that's just me making up bullshit for it. <laughs> There's a point where uh, Pink Fox Girl, I, I hate that I can't remember her name, is like in her room talking to herself about how much she hates Michiru's like ideology and how she sees the world. That never gets resolved. <laughs> they never talk about it on screen, ever. And she's just shit talking the way her friend views life. I imagine. And that's, that's not how somebody talks when you like someone. I imagine it'll come up again if there's more. I know that there's a book it's based off of that has more to adapt, but I don't know if they're actually going to be able to adapt it. If <laughs> anything Trigger does is wildly more expensive than it's worth. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know, man. Say something nice about it. I like the final battle. It got big flashy lasers <laughs> and big dog. <laughs> <laughs> that furry side of me that wants to like really ridiculous stuff was like <laughs> as soon as he had like three heads and was shooting lasers in every direction <laughs> i was like this is so fucking stupid and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> they really have mastered the whole this is so fucking stupid and i love it thing <laughs> I, I think watching promare solidified that for me because i think the whole lesson of promare is you know learning to just be stupid and that's okay it's not a bad thing yeah as long as you're like in control of it <laughs> yeah as long as you're still competent in the ways you need to be competent <laughs> if you're a decent stupid person it's okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but they really just straight that whole movie is just trigger being stupid because it's what they love to do <laughs> yeah maybe that's why i'm looking at bna so harshly <sighs> i feel like Promare was kind of like so so much the high point of trigger bullshit that I was like, okay, now come back around and do something grounded and show us that you can without it being boring. Yeah, it definitely felt like that in the beginning, and it definitely didn't end up becoming that in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Not not specifically that I wanted them to do that with Promare, but just whatever their next thing was going to be. Yeah. So when, when B&A got announced and it looked like it was going to be like, it looked like it was going to be cyberpunk future kind of stuff. It's like from the art style and from the early shots and stuff. And then we kind of got like modern day political drama, all the characters overlap in some way. And that is mostly fine. The baseball episode that you love so much. Mm, yeah, that's such a good episode. But man, there was that heavy handed episode where they were like, do you know the one streamer girl who goes to the one place and then everyone treats her like she's an animal show thing and Th then she almost dies? Remember that? God. That was so heavy handed. I think that's why hopefully Trigger tends to avoid these kinds of things for the most part, because when they do them, I imagine they at least notice the level of people being like, mm, that you didn't do it well. <laughs> <laughs> that episode made me uncomfortable and yeah. not in the way that it's supposed to. It didn't make it's not a it really made you think kind of episode. It's like a that was just unpleasant. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> It, it didn't say anything. It didn't make any real world comparisons. You just put a character in an uncomfortable situation and said, that's a racism. Yep. What's next on the list? The best. The best for last. Talking about that Undertale. Ah, uh, yes. The Undertitty. So Undertale was uh, is an interesting everything. <laughs> uh, for me in particular, I played Undertale before it got really big. Because I'm kind of super into the indie game scene. So, and everybody I knew was into what's it called? Uh, Homestuck. Yeah. Uh, God forbid I even bring that up. Um, <laughs> that is a forbidden word. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody I knew was into Homestuck. So, Toby Fox being tangentially related to Homestuck, uh, I knew about Undertale. Like, before any YouTuber was playing it, before all of that sort of thing. So I played it completely devoid of knowing how much people would come to love it. And, you know, like one of my friends recommended it to me and they were like, this is a really good game. You have to play it. And I was like, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking about it. I don't have anything to do. It's cheap. Why not? Come to find out that it was like only a five hour experience and it felt like it took months out of my life. Oh, yeah. It 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 was like days, like at least a week or two of experience for me because I I was like a little bit behind you. I remember one of the reasons I started playing it was because I had heard you were playing it and you liked it. And I noticed like one or two YouTube videos popping up about it. I dip my toe in the indie scene when something really interests me. I like off. I played the shit out of off. And this gave me some similar vibes. So I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll, I'll hop into that. I'm really glad I hopped into it a little bit later because I got like a normal playthrough out of it. And then by the time I got the normal playthrough, it was common knowledge about the pacifist playthrough was like the true ending. And so I was like, oh good, I don't want to fucking go back through do this anymore. <laughs> I love the game, but I'm not the kind of person that can go through and do a genocide route. <laughs> yeah, I was halfway through my first playthrough when someone told me about 
the pacifist run. And then I remember restarting halfway through. Not sure if my experience was better or worse for that at this point, but I remember doing like half of a run and then some people remembering me. And then in the latter half of the run, people like not. Because, you know, like they have that like, why do you seem familiar kind of dialogue or something like that. Yeah. So even seeing that was a mechanic in the game kind of made me regret not finishing that first run and seeing where it led, learning the lesson and then doing it again. Yeah. When a video game is really good and a lot of people are very passionate about it and the pacifist ending is now uh, seen as one of the hallmarks of all gaming. Oh, it's so <laughs> good. Undertale is probably up in my top five games up with like Ratchet and Clank 2, Journey, and then Undertale's probably it. Like, it's probably number two in place of Journey, actually. Twilight Princess is in my top five, yeah. which says a lot about just me as a person. I think Undertale is really interesting in the way that it transcends the stigma that some of the like more obnoxious, you know, fandoms have obnoxious people. That's just fandoms. But, you know, sometimes that becomes the face of something. But it still transcends that. Because there's never any point that anything about the community of Undertale is cringe enough for me to not be like, no, Undertale is like a fucking piece of art <laughs> yeah it is god tier <laughs> there are there have been a lot of things i've been into where after fans get crazy about it and they start doing weird shit where i bail but undertale nah that shit's for life yeah it was one of the first games if it's definitely one of the only games i played that are so in your heart as an experience yeah you literally bonded with a piece of software <laughs> Yep. It's incredible. The fact that the characters in Undertale don't actually technically exist is a fact that I have to remind myself of. Because they're just, they're so, there's so much soul in them. Yeah. Oh man, that true ending is fucking masterful. That is one of the few game experiences that gives you so much direct, like, it, it, it immerses you in the way that you care about this battle so much, you're not willing to give up. And that part where you're the you first death of the final boss and the heart comes back together, I fucking cry at that every time. <laughs> <laughs> but it refused. Oh my god. The the first time Undertale made me cry. <laughs> It was when I was walking through, you know, like you get to the part of like the Undercity where it's like the huge expanse of city by like where Asgore lives. Yeah. And like all the monsters are coming up and then they're telling you the story of like what happened to Asriel. The dirtiest sob I have ever had in my life. That, that definitely nearly got me. I can't listen to that music box arrangement of hopes and dreams without crying for sure. <laughs> I can't I can't listen to straight up the Undertale theme, like the main song that plays during that section without crying, yeah. tearing up at all. The first good two years after hearing that song, I was still like actively like <laughs> 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 it's it's still fucking powerful i was telling you how i went back through to find some really good interesting instances where people have used music cues and endings in a masterful way that really amplified the whole thing and hopes and dreams is that 200 and fucking 10 percent just going back through and re-watching re that ending to you know study it a bit oh it, you i get the same rush from watching somebody play that as I do from playing it. It's so, it just pulls you in so hard. Yeah, absolutely. But I did want to bring up Undertale in the context of how it does deal with the racism thing, which is to say, while the monsters were in the mountain, the racism thing kind of went away and it wasn't a, it wasn't a thing anymore outside. So they go out and then everything's fine. What is interesting is that Asgore is, I guess, at that point, like such an old king that... S simp. <laughs> he's such an old king that he sort of like keeps that grudge as part of him. That really like shitty lie because he could have just gone out at any time. Big man, baby, grudge. Man, child, fucking tend into his flowers after genocide and shall I'll beat the shit. I, I, I hate, I hate that. That is one character I do not like from Undertale. And I know I'm being uh, too much on this one for sure. I'm definitely beating down on this sweet old goat man too hard. <laughs> <laughs> but 
maybe it's because of how how much I love Toriel and that scene where she like still rejects him at the end. I'm like, fucking go, girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crushes balls. I think Asgore is good character and a shitty person, and I 100% would have done the same thing he did. Yeah, I think it's definitely far more ambiguous than I give it credit for but from my standpoint not being in that situation it sure is just nice to see him get rejected by his (laughs) ex-wife yeah you you know what sucks about that though (laughs) is now everybody ships sans and toriel together and sans is like an eight-year-old i need to get like a confirmation on that for sure i need to look it up because i think what changed it for me is i watched criticals play through that was my first like audio experience of sans because he did like voice acting for sans as he played through and it was so perfect that like a grown man child that just loves tricks became his character for me (laughs) (laughs) so for me it's like this dorky ass old man dad joke chad winning over (laughs) the (laughs) This hot milf woman. (laughs) I think the reason he has that vibe is because it's the same. It's the same. I've been alive for like 3000 years or whatever. Yeah, that too, for sure. So that carries over into like everything he does. So when you think, oh yeah, he's like, he's like probably as old as Toriel mentally. It's like, let's not use that. Yeah, that is, that's not a good (laughs) fiction. Be crazy. People be making excuses. (sighs) Yeah, in almost everything we brought up today, there's been some weird underage controversy. Can can furries, can furry media, can any media just please stop? <laughs> Look, if you want to make a story about people who are like in school together, put them in college, dude. Like make a story about college age people. That's fine. Yeah, they're like adults. They still have growing to do. They can meet new people and get attached still. People still make stupid mistakes in college. That's kind of what it's all about. Yeah. More so than high school. You know, being horny is for sure a part of being a teenager. But the idea of depicting that is like an area we probably shouldn't touch in media. Maybe that stays to like sex ed and not adult business. And we stray from that totally in media and keep it out of things we like because I am so tired of defending things I like because some creepy ass writer decided to include someone who's like 17 or something. (laughs) Let's let's recycle our list. What's at the top? Uh, Beastars? Beastars. <laughs> one of the biggest offenders of that for me, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about There She Is some more. Yeah, we should. I mean, that'll, that'll poss- we've lost our Zoomer audience already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what There She Is is, because uh, I don't think we've summarized it for the people who just aren't... Yeah, if you aren't like 30 and weren't on Newgrounds in... 2008 (laughs) or just on furry message boards looking at every single shockwave flash animation that people ever made if you weren't in the niche of the niche required to get access to this cute emotional korean animation (laughs) go watch there she is it's on youtube like all compilated and everything i'm pretty sure yeah by sam bosca that's how you would say it i believe you i think (laughs) yeah go watch there she is it's a very emotional journey about one person who reluctantly falls in love and one person who very quickly falls in love and they have a lot of differences in their lives And and it does the oppression thing right for like the only piece of furry media that does that Pretty much, because every other one just sort of slaps a placation on top. Yeah. You will probably cry unless you are just the hardest of asses. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, just sit in a dark room at like 4 a.m. If you're listening to this podcast right now and it's like 2 a.m. after this podcast, watch it. <laughs> if you, you will cry like alone in your bed. If you don't night. cry, I give you permission to let me know so I can block you out of fear. <laughs> <laughs> 
Please, please tell me if you don't cry at that because you're terrifying. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No invalidating feelings here. Yeah, that would be lame. Lame like racism, bad allegories in equivalent season. <laughs> yeah, this whole this whole podcast has just kind of been saying racism bad without getting too political. And I think I want to address. Yeah, let's not do the thing we've been talking shit on like, yeah. for what an hour. <laughs> yeah, I, I want I want to address just to I don't want to give a placation. But at the same time, I don't want to not put this in the podcast and make it official and just say it out loud. Black Lives Matter. All cops are bastards. Capitalism sucks. I love my friends who are all LGBT community members. And you are welcome here. That's it. I second every last bit of that. I mean, if you know me at all, you know that I'm full of anti-capitalist hatred and anything, hatred for anything that is hatred, essentially, and that's not a contradiction. Unjustified hatred in this world, and you are not going to find any of it here. So with that in mind, I would like to get back onto the concept of funny animal people for the sake of escapism from the troubles of reality. What's something... I, I feel like there's more than just this five we've got, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Uh, these are good examples because they all kind of... They have a connection between the different variances of the take of racism bad. Right. <laughs> but I do want to talk about more of just furry media and, and furry media in general. So I'd love to talk about stuff like Ratchet and Clank again, but oh, I don't yeah. know if I want to get into that. We could um, talk about... We could talk about... Yeah. You know what? Let's just have an episode where we address and talk about all the furry video game shit we like as like a part two of this podcast. So we can just be like, yeah, we love Ratchet and Clank and Sly Cooper and Crash Bandicoot and 90s mascot fever made a furry out of everybody. <laughs> uh, you, there, I feel bad for anyone who's ever wanting to try and search Bowser at all. I haven't tried, but I guarantee safe search will not help you <laughs> i don't think safe search helped me like be protected from new ground results back in the day yeah like that shit would pop up in google uh there there was sure something real easily accessible about just porn back in the day <laughs> it's probably just worse. as accessible uh, or worse now we I just don't know we just know where it is so we don't even gotta like <laughs> we, we skip over the whole classic kid googling boobs thing because we're adults now and we just know where porn is <laughs> Right. We we know where to find uh, really good furry porn. And some of us are porn artists on occasion, I imagine. I always try to say illustrator because I'm terrified of, for one, one day when someone asks me what it is that I do and I have to give them an honest answer. I tell them porn artist and then they're like, oh, so you're just slapping cheeks all the time and recording it. <laughs> 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 I have thought, I have thought several times, we're off of the topic of furry media, but I have thought several times, why do people not just rotoscope clapping cheeks more and then throw some like wolf fur drawn over it? I think that would be a real easy way to, well, there's nothing about animation ever that's easy. Even the easiest forms of animation still suck. <laughs> but I feel like there's probably some people doing that somewhere that just are not doing it fast enough to notice because that's animation for you. <laughs> yep. Oh, I, I sure would like to do some animation someday when I've got 10 extra years added to my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I had time for that too. That's a thing that I gave up on a long time ago because I was afraid of how much time it would take. You got to get to like where I am with just illustration where I just know all the shortcuts. I'm, I don't have to think, there's no disconnect between me and the tablet because I have my process so refined that I jump in and I draw. That's the level you got to be at with animation for it to be viable. <laughs> yeah, even remotely. Because there's people like, I guess we can name drop porn artists. <laughs> there's people like, what, Ata and Horse even? God, I haven't seen stuff from them in a long time. I had like three artists in my head before I started the sentence and now they're all gone. 
I don't actually, I, I guess I just don't look that much into the animation side of it because the only things I do see are the ones that are like the big fancy animations that someone spent like a year of their life. God, a year of their life working on. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> I think that's why I prefer illustration because I can pump out a piece of art if I'm lucky in probably like a week if it's like a pretty average process and then be like, well, I'm proud of that. And it it, it wasn't a struggle and it wasn't a year long progress of, oh, <laughs> I want to do things like that on the side for sure. But I'm not at the place where I've got time for that right now. But someday I'll have side projects that'll take me years. I do not want any main projects that take me years. Yeah. But art is one of those things that's it's very extremely connected to the furry community ever since kind of its inception. Yeah. Like just saying funny animal people is not really a meme it's what they were called back then yeah it's uh the tex avery cartoons and the tom and jerry type stuff chuck jones all that kind of stuff don bluff it was all equally just as much fun and then the horny side was absolutely unavoidable at the same time so a lot of those people drew porn yeah <laughs> what, what's his name uh classical mangaka yeah, we're just going to be bad with names this whole podcast. Yeah, but he did like Astro Boy stuff and then he had a ton of porn of mouse girls and stuff just found in his drawers after he died. That's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's going to be me with like bad dragon <laughs> 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 Man, we keep talking about not safe for work stuff, but I did. I, I wanted to get back to um, like games and stuff that we've played because we've talked about like Star Fox and stuff. Oh, but we yeah. haven't talked about like what specifically it is about furry stuff in general that kind of like brought us in. From an artist's perspective, I've realized that one thing that draws me to it. Uh, funny, funny pun. Expressions are so much more expressive with the styles you can do with anthropomorphic well, creatures in general. There, there's a bigger window without getting too cartoony that you can't quite do the same way with humans because if you start pushing expressions too far with humans, it just goes cartoony. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not the way I... It's not the same thing I like to draw. <laughs> For me, I think it was back to those... Back to those animations, like way back in the day. Like when I first got into the furry community at all or even learned that it was a thing like i said i found those flash animations on just like message boards they were the raw file oh my god yeah it was a it was a link to the raw file of the shockwave flash animation <laughs> but people just pick up their mouse because nobody had a tablet back then and they would like draw characters doing cool shit fun shit fantastical shit there was one animation, it was it was a remix of a techno song, and it was like a slow-paced, had vocals in it kind of song. I want to say it was something called like The Riddle or something like that. And it wasn't even done, but it was just like someone playing a flute, so there's like a castle in the background. I'm probably blowing someone's mind with like <laughs> remembering this, but just, I don't know, being alone in my room watching these cool animations was like, it was very much what I did at 14. Yeah. I think I definitely got into the fandom first, and then as I saw the appeal of anthropomorphic characters just stylistically is when i started to get into other things and other mediums like star fox and whatnot there is definitely something about like the 2000s rave furry scene that drug my <laughs> teenage ass kicking and screaming right into the community <laughs> that was the oh, kind man. of shit that my edgy teen ass needed <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is gonna be weird to say but like my dad used to play like these techno songs on his car radio all the fucking time so i was really into techno so when the furries grabbed techno stuff and then added their animations to it the, the animations i was already in love with to it i was like oh hell yeah this is my shit no matter how bad it was <laughs> i guarantee i can at some point find a picture of my persona in trip pants 
110%. I can find one of my... I have one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> one of the first drawings I ever did of my first one was Murder spr- Trick Pants. We've been bringing back Sparkle Dogs. I've seen a few people drawing those again. Let's bring back the Trip Pants. <laughs> We're going to bring back Trip Pants. We're going to bring back those AMVs on YouTube where all you did was color shift it to through the rainbow. And it was like a black and white image. I'm about to validate my teenage self and buy like a the hazard symbol goggles <laughs> uh, buy myself a large black leather trench coat and just a wolf head <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, you know then we can go out in the, the rave scene <laughs> I'm gonna have to bleep the town name yeah <laughs> but you know the, the small town Kansas rave scene <laughs> Ugh, gross. <laughs> gross. Because that's what, that was like four people here. Yeah. Way back in the day. Oh, we had some embarrassing raves with like, the you know that fruit juice that's sparkling so it looks like it's like alcohol. It's like putting the wine glasses. <laughs> yeah. We had that. We had like s- snacks that our moms <laughs> bought us for our oh. rave. <laughs> I, I remember... I don't know how old Pretty Rave Girl is at this oh point. Oh my god. <laughs> I know it's a meme, but Caramel Dancing was fire. Well, it's still fire, but it was fire back then. When, like when it was fresh, you were like, oh my god, this is good song. And I can just <laughs> fucking throw it in a techno remix. <laughs> oh my god. The first convention I ever went to in like 2009, NACACon, was 2000, 2009, 2008. And I remember wearing a free hug sign. Oh my God. And I remember. Please glomp me. <laughs> please. People were getting glomped <laughs> and people were having to like tell them not to do it. Yeah. They like compromised and they were like, okay. Only glomp people who have a free glomp sign. Consensual glomping. Consensual glomping only. The fact that doesn't even sound like a word anymore. How many yaoi paddles have you seen in your life? <laughs> a good couple dozen. <laughs> Didn't y'all own a yaoi paddle at one point? Thankfully not, although I wouldn't be surprised if somebody I know had tried to custom make one at one point. That sounds like something you would do. Uh, maybe in high school, you. if I made it with like a with like duct tape or some stupid janky shit. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Oh man, we were such stupid furry degenerates back in the day. It's it's, uh, it's embarrassing, but you, like you have to acknowledge your past. Yeah, I, I sometimes <laughs> I think about if I get on Facebook, I got like the the history thing and. Going back through that is a gamble because if you go back far enough, you get the carrot W sign carrots and the replies to family on Facebook or something. Oh. Oh. That fills me with a fear that I just have to remind myself of every once in a while. So I make sure to never repeat those (laughs) mistakes. Yeah, I don't even I don't even freaking talk in emoticons or emojis at all to people who don't do it to me first yeah i show it as like a sign of emotion or personality if i know the people are like aware of it and i'm comfortable enough around that person but if it's family no we we're breaking out the period and we're breaking out like the cold simple reply (laughs) yeah i remember when you're a teenager like you know your parents don't understand your sense of fashion and Man, it was in that height of like rave mentality and sort of like the almost BDSM style casual wear where like people are wearing like just oh my God. <laughs> so many belts, like belts and chokers and spikes. Yeah, and spikes. People like literally carrying like crops around as just an accessory. That was the style. God, um, I was destined to be really horny from like day one. The moment I like uh, discovered that scene, I was like, you know, I guess I'm going to be just dedicating to this for the rest of my life. Okay, so the reason I brought that up was to segue into uh, <laughs> when I was like 15, I asked my mom for a collar. <laughs> I asked my mom to buy me, like, a collar as, like, an accessory. Like, an actual dog collar. 
my partner and I, Avery, we, we've done that a few times. I definitely have come home with a collar on. <laughs> I I don't think about that very often. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> the, the collar my mom got me, because she did get me one. Oh, God. It was, like, blue, and then it had, like, a strip of, like, sparkly glitter on it. <laughs> It was very clearly like oh. for dogs. <laughs> what a pretty princess! <laughs> it was. I was so straight at the time, <laughs> and so I was like, I don't want the sparkles. <laughs> Mom, That's you not bought me, me the rock collar. I, I think I said that too. Like, <laughs> come on, it's a, a dog collar. Simple, one color, black. <laughs> oh. Oh my god, it's so fucking stupid. I don't know if I want to tell this one because it's it's directly related to the collar, but it's also like really bad. I mean, you can cut it out. <laughs> you have to tell me if I should cut this out or not. Okay. So my mom also got me a set of dog tags. What did they say? <laughs> On one side, it just said, oh man, I'm cringing so hard. But on one side it said Wolfie, W-U-L-F-E-E. -E. <laughs> and on the other side, it said, if lost, please return to his mommy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we gotta not keep, we, we, can't, we can't not keep that in. Because, <laughs> I mean, your mom knows about it, so it's not gonna bother her to hear it. <laughs> but that's just fucking too good. <laughs> I haven't ever told anybody this because I immediately <laughs> hid it forever. I think I might still have it. Oh my god. Not the collar, but the tag for some fucking reason. I mean... Why I would have kept something like that, I don't know. It, it could be weirdly sentimental, but the weird part <sighs> is definitely the bigger part of it. <laughs> it that's so embarrassing <sighs> i thankfully i like directly avoided any somehow any contact with my parents with furry stuff except like on facebook when i changed my profile icon to my fursona back in like 2010 for like a year or that one time and i thankfully can say this because my mom doesn't listen to the podcast <laughs> But uh, that one time that I was uploading art and using my mom's laptop because it was the only thing I could use to upload art. And I guess I didn't delete it. I don't know how I would make such a simple mistake, but I somehow didn't delete it all the way properly. And she found it and she came to me and she was like, I don't want to see this ever again. I was like, you never will. <laughs> <laughs> So I had a worse thing, I think, was that I um I came from school one day when I was like 11 and my parents were in my room on my computer looking through my internet history. Oh, God. And because my dad was super nosy. He's always been super nosy. But I get home and my parents are sitting at my computer and there's a picture of Lola Bunny bent over Bugs' knee with two fingers in her gooch. <laughs> yeah. And it's that old Dr. Comet picture of it. Oh my God. <laughs> and I never jerked off to Dr. Comet again. That's understandable. That that's traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> and we had we had the talk as a family. All five of us. My oh brothers God. too. It sucked. I was gonna tell like another embarrassing story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I love how I love her just like all right. <laughs> well, I mean, I was gonna tell you last time when you were like, I've got it even worse. When I was like, Alex, you're the only one doing this to yourself at this point. <laughs> okay, so my parents kind of got super used to the idea of just furry stuff. They were like, well, you can like whatever you like. We won't judge you, I guess. <laughs> and they had to promise not to go into my room and be on my computer ever again. <laughs> they had to promise me. I, I, I understand that because I feel like if I were in the same situation, I would never, ever 
I mean, I, shit, I never ever gave my mother access to any sort of art of mine ever again. So I kind of did the same thing where in an opposite way where instead of you know, promise me you'll never do this again. It's like, I will do everything in my power to make sure you never know about my secret life. <laughs> So that was a segue, again, <laughs> into my younger brother eventually found the furry phantom, independent of me. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. <laughs> and for probably a good year, he refused to have anything but furry porn as his desktop wall wallpaper. That I like that. I like I, I like that aesthetic. I gotta gotta go with that a little bit. <laughs> he was thirteen. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe not the prime age for that. You know what was right around the corner like a year later from this? Oh, God. The advent of the My Little Pony fandom. Oh, no. Yeah. So guess who had My Little Pony porn? <laughs> I, am, I am calling you out. My Little Pony Porn as their <laughs> desktop wallpaper for the year after that. <laughs> Your brother's gonna have this same conversation with someone someday where he's like, oh my fucking God, I was 14 and I had My Little Pony Porn on my desktop. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's probably gonna want me to take it to the grave. Well, too late. <laughs> <laughs> he could cut this out, but he's not going to. I never will. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's to end this podcast, I guess we'll just say, like, furry media in general has a lot of opportunity to inspire people. Yes. And if you are going to try to tell the story of oppression, maybe you want to inspire the right message. Maybe don't simplify it so damn much to, like, there's so many degrees of simplification that a lot of furry media takes the racism discussion that invalidate the real racism discussion and that's the biggest issue when they do it wrong i feel like a lot of the reason they do it is because corporate was going to be like you can't have a strong political message and the fact that it even is a political message is a problem but zootopia's whole beta idea got completely scrapped oh yeah i keep forgetting about that completely it was at least trying a little harder <laughs> I think it was almost heavy handed, actually. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was a fucking shot collar slave situation. It was a little too heavy handed. And then they went the opposite direction and got too light handed. Maybe just try to say something if you're going to try to say something. <laughs> yeah. If you're, yeah. If you're going to, yes. <laughs> if you're going to tell that story, then you need to make sure that you don't just say the easiest answer yeah. that anyone in their right mind should say. Racism bad is not a thing. Revolutionary concept. Yeah, it's not something that anyone should be disagreeing with. Those that do are the problem, and everyone else is just the majority and the people that understand. <laughs> it's, uh... It's, it's maybe missing the point of inspiring people by a lot. Yeah, you can do better than the bare minimum of, oh, maybe we should all be nice, guys. And maybe address the issues that cause the not-niceness. Yeah. <laughs> what, do we have any plans for the next episode? We kind of jumped into the furry one without any warning. Yep. <clears throat> And I feel like there's a lot more furry shit that we could talk about, video game related, but I guess we... Oh, uh, yeah, that. that's right. I think we can possibly save some of that for the next episode. I don't think that'll fill an entire episode, but we'll figure something out. Yeah, we'll figure out where to put it when we talk about video games again. I think we're getting to the point to where just having a general subject... Maybe we'll start doing what other podcasts do where we line up. I mean, maybe that's how structure works. Maybe they, they, they plan a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> is this how we become a real podcast <laughs> do we uh make a schedule and stick to it well i mean we were gonna do that originally and then we just didn't yeah well you will know what the subject of the next episode is when it's in the title <laughs> and you'll know what the subject of this episode was supposed to be when it's in the title <laughs> yes <laughs> thanks for listening see ya